let me begin with a little history. The pilgrims came to America in 1620. On December the 26th, 1620, 102 passengers set foot on land and began to establish the colony of Plymouth. The pilgrims immediately began to build their shelters, but soon after that, a general sickness swept through the entire colony and around 46 members of 102, almost half their number, died that winter of illness. Uh, you may not have read it, but the, the Light and the Glory by Peter Marshall and David Manuel. Have you guys ever read that, The Light and the Glory? Well, the words I'm about to, to read now, it's not word for word and it's not in sequence, but it's pretty much from uh, that book. It says, the summer of 1621 was beautiful and that fall's harvest provided more than enough corn to see them through their second winter. The pilgrims were brimming over with brimming over with uh, gratitude, not only to their Indian friends, but also to their God. In him they trusted, and he honored their obedience beyond their dreams. Therefore, Governor Bradford declared a day of public thanksgiving to be held in October. Massasuit, is that, am I pronouncing that right? Anybody know? An Indian. Actually, I learned later this week that Massasuit was actually his title. It wasn't his actual name. I can't remember his actual name, but everybody just calls him Massasuit. He received an invitation uh, to this Thanksgiving, and he unexpectedly arrived a day early and had 90 Indians with him. The pilgrims prayed hard to keep from giving in to despair. To feed such a crowd would cut deeply into the food supply that was supposed to get them through the winter. However, they learned one thing through their travails. Trust God implicitly. As it turned out, the Indians not only arrived empty hand, didn't arrive empty-handed, they arrived with no less than five dressed deer and more than a dozen fat wild turkeys. The pilgrims, in turn, provided the vegetables from their household gardens, carrots, onions, turnips, cucumbers, radishes, beets, and cabbages. A joyous occasion for all. Things went so well that Thanksgiving Day, that first Thanksgiving Day, was extended for three days. One month later, in November, a full year after their arrival, the first ship from home dropped anchor in the harbor, leaving off a cargo at Plymouth, 35 more colonists. In the air of celebration that followed, no one stopped to think that these newcomers brought not one bit of equipment with them, no food, no clothing, no tools, no bedding. In the cool light of the following morning, a sobering appraisal by Bradford, Brewster, and Winslow was taken, and a grim decision was reached. They would all have to go on half rations through the winter to ensure enough food to see them into the summer season when the fish and game would be plentiful. That winter, they entered into a time of starving. With all the extra people to feed and shelter, they were ultimately reduced, get this, to a daily ration of five kernels of corn apiece. The people of Plymouth turned to Christ and not one of them died of starvation. When spring finally arrived, 1623, they were well aware that they needed at least twice as much corn as their first harvest. The first planting would be for common use while the second planting would be for private use. After the first planting, a dry spell set in and turned into a 12-week drought. The crops withered along with the hopes of the pilgrims. Edward Winslow described it this way. These and the like considerations moved not only every good man privately to enter into examination with his own estate between God and his conscience and so to humiliation before him, but also to humble ourselves together before the Lord by fasting and prayer. To that end, a day was appointed by public authority and set apart from all other employments. But oh, the mercy of our God, who was as ready to hear as we were to ask. 
For though in the morning when we assembled together, the heavens were as clear and the drought as likely to continue as it ever was, yet, parentheses, our exercise continuing some eight or nine hours, prayer and fasting, yet before our departure, the weather was overcast, the clouds gathered on all sides, and the next morning distilled such soft, sweet, and moderate showers of rain, continuing some 14 days and mixed with such seasonable weather as it was hard to say whether our withered corn or drooping affections were most quickened or revived. Such was the bounty and goodness of our God. Amen. The yield that year was so abundant the pilgrims ended up with a surplus of corn, corn which they were able to use in trading that winter with northern Indians who had not had a good growing season. That fall, a second day of Thanksgiving was planned, and Massasuit was again the guest of honor, and this time he brought his wife and 120 braves. Fortunately, he again brought venison and turkey. The first course of that glorious second Thanksgiving meal was a plate of each pers- in front of each person, a plate in front of each person with five kernels of corn, lest anyone should forget Greg Easterbrook wrote a book, and actually the title of the book says it all. It's called The Progress Paradox, How Life Gets Better While People Get Worse. Life gets better while people get worse. You realize that we are the most privileged and prosperous people who have ever lived on the face of the earth, and yet... Many of our American family, friends, are not happy, not thankful. We have more of everything. We have more of everything, and yet we are not content. Cicero called gratitude not only the greatest of virtues, But gratitude to him was also the parent of all other virtues. In other words, all other virtues grow from gratitude. The philosopher Immanuel Kant said that ingratitude is the essence of vileness. Gratitude, thankfulness, has slowly but surely disappeared from our culture. Entitlement, greed, yeah. But because gratitude has disappeared, all other virtues are woefully lacking in our society and within the church. Richard Watley said it well when he wrote in the 1800s, It is generally, listen carefully, it is generally true that all that is required to make men unmindful of what they owe God for any blessing is that they should receive that blessing often and regularly. Let me read it again. It is generally true that all that is required to make men unmindful or make men forget What they owe God for any blessing is that they should receive that blessing often and regularly. We are so blessed, and most of our blessings occur every single day. Every day we have food, every day we have shelter. We don't ever, hardly ever go to bed with pains of hunger. Most of us are in good health, most of us drive around in decent cars. And every day, these things are true. But every day, we take it for granted and cease to give thanks. Somehow the pilgrims knew that if they forgot their struggle, they would cease to be truly thankful for their abundance. That's why they had those five kernels on that plate. We all have a few things we should never forget. They didn't want to forget that winter. 
we have a few things we shouldn't forget because if we do, we may cease to be thankful. Before we go there, I want to share some thoughts to you with you that came, came from one of uh, Alistair Begg's sermons that I listened to a couple weeks ago. I don't know if you know Alistair Begg. If you don't, you need to. You need to listen to him. He's, he's one of the best, in my opinion. If you had no one else to listen to, listen to him. So we live in a world where now, this moment, is really all that matters. You're familiar with the phrase carpe diem? What's that mean? Seize the day. Seize the moment. This can be a very positive statement. It can mean that every day we seek to be present. That's something we need to be. And we seek to make the very best of that day that we can. It can mean that we seek to take every day captive for the will of God, just like we seek to take every thought captive to the will of God. If we're so busy thinking about yesterday or tomorrow, we can lose sight of today. So carpe diem can be a positive statement. Unfortunately, carpe diem in our society is not something that we should strive for, at least the way that our society interprets. It basically means to live only for today. All that matters is this moment. Take full advantage of this day to fulfill all the pleasures you can, because who knows if tomorrow will ever come. Forget, forget what the past teaches us. Don't give any thought to what may the, be the consequences tomorrow of my actions today. When we have no understanding of history, when we have no sense of tomorrow, we live only for this moment. And normally when we live only for this moment, we live only for ourselves. This kind of living produces greed and pride and sensuality, but it does not produce a sense of gratitude or thankfulness. Living without thought for the past or the future causes a person to be self-centered, self-absorbed, and ungrateful. When blessings come their way, <laughs> is simply a result of their hard work. And they really, they really can think of no one else to thank but themselves because they did it. Living only for the moment means I'm never content. I always want more because tomorrow, it doesn't even enter my mind what tomorrow may be. I must have it and I must have it today. Even if having it today means I won't have something else tomorrow. Having said that, I think we can easily see how this kind of living affects our world and how it has plagued our world. It doesn't matter what happened in history. What matters is what's happening right now today. We don't care about that. We don't care about the future. But right now, I'm not preaching to the world. I'm preaching to us. You are the body of Christ. And I'm preaching to myself, to all of us who love the Lord. Because honestly, folks, we too can live only in the moment. And we too can forget to be thankful. Forget to live with contentment. Forget to live with an earnest desire to give of ourselves for others. Paul said... Paul told us to always be thankful. Ephesians chapter 5, give thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians chapter 3, he said, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts since as members of one body you were called to peace and be thankful. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, be joyful always. 
Pray continually. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. Joyful, peaceful, thankful, always. Always. <laughs> Those aren't suggestions that Paul's giving to us. The Greek here is in the imperative. That means it's a strong exhortation. If, if Paul were God, it would, be an, it would be a command. But since this is the word of God inspired through Paul, I think we can take it as a command. This is God's command to us. To always be joyful and peaceful and thankful. Oh, let's be honest. If we're living in the moment, mindful of only what's happening in that moment, there are always times when we find it difficult to be thankful or joyful or peaceful. I believe it is a tr truth that we can only be thankful at all times as we live in any given moment, as we reflect on the past and our future hope. Let me say that again. Being thankful in the moment requires that I'm thinking of more than the moment. Living a life of gratitude means that I am not just thinking about this moment that I have to be thankful. I'm thinking about all that's happened in the past and all that I'm looking forward to in the future. Those are the only ways that I can be thankful in all things. Sure, there are, there are wonderful moments in life where we're thankful, but there are other moments in life that's hard to give thanks. Remembering the past doesn't mean that we dwell on the past. Paul said, one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and straining forward to what lies ahead, I press on toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. When Paul says forgetting the past or forgetting what lies behind, he wasn't saying that he's removing his memory, that he's removing the events of the past from his, from his mind, but that he is not allowing anything in the past to prevent him from moving forward toward Jesus. You see, some people cannot be thankful today. Some of us as Christians have a hard time being thankful today because we cannot get past our past. We believe our sin is more than God can truly forgive. Yeah, we know it in our mind. We know all about the theology of it. But it's hard to convince our heart that it's true, that God has forgiven us. And that keeps us, it robs us from being able to experience the goodness of God and rejoicing over that goodness. Think about Paul's past. If there was anyone, if there was anyone who had an issue getting over their past and being able to be rejoice in the Lord and be thankful now, it would be Paul because Paul persecuted Christians and actually stood by and participated in the death of Christians. But listen to what Paul said. First uh, Timothy chapter 1, verse 15. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. He didn't forget it. He knew it. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, as the worst, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were, able, who were to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of the ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. Amen. I thank Paul. Remembered his past, but his past caused him 
to rejoice even more. Paul lived with the knowledge of his past sins, but he also lived and rejoiced in the fact that in Jesus Christ, God forgave him. We, as followers of Christ, must never surrender to, uh, when we have surrendered to God and placed our faith in Jesus, never allow Satan to convince us that that moment wasn't true. In that moment, God buried all our sins. Every single one of them. Even the ones I hadn't committed yet. They're gone. They're buried in the depth of the sea. He no no longer holds any sin against us as long as we continue to place our faith in Jesus Christ. So don't allow uh, Satan to rob you of a grateful heart by making you think or be absorbed in what you've done in the past if you've placed your faith in Christ. In those moments when you've failed God, or it seems your world has fallen apart, it seems there's nothing to be thankful for, remember that day when he showed you his love. I remember that day like it were yesterday. I ponder it often, (laughs) for my sins are many. Remember the love he demonstrated to you by sending his son Jesus Christ to die in your place and to live a perfect life to be given to your account. And remember that there is not one thing in this world, nothing, not even your own sin, that can separate you from Christ's love. You having a bad day? Think about that. Remember, because he loves you, he takes all things and makes them work for your good. That's not just a pithy saying. That's the truth. And if you've lived long enough, you've discovered that. Remember, God created the world. Don't forget that. Don't let our society teach you anything else. He is God. He is all-powerful And he is always watching over you. Alistair Begg, uh, he wrote a book, uh, Pray Big. And one of the chapters in it was, he says, we, we need to think about how we pray. And he says, one of the things we need to stop saying is, God, please be with so and so. We don't need to pray that. God has already promised, I'm with you always to the end of the world. We don't need to ask that. We need to realize that God is for us. He is the creator. He is God. The fickle finger of faith is not in control of this world. God is. Yes, Satan throws his wrench in the wheel every now and then. He likes to disturb God's plan. But just like the cross, God takes every act of Satan and turns it out to our benefit. As we're living in the moment, we must also remember that Jesus not only died for us, he defeated death for us. It's not just a past event that we're looking at, but because he rose from the dead, we're now looking forward to a hope that goes into eternity. His resurrection assures our resurrection. You might think it flippant, but it's not. What's the worst thing Satan can do to us in this world? What's the worst thing the world can do to us? Kill us. Who cares? We've got eternity. His resurrection ensures our resurrection. And you know what Paul said? Paul said, if that's not true, if he didn't rise from the dead, then we won't rise from the dead. But if he did, we will. If that's not true, then we should just live as the world lives. Carpe diem. He said it this way. Eat, drink, and be merry, for tomorrow we die. We're done. No more existence whatsoever. So make the most of today. Jesus' resurrection assures us That this life is not all there is, folks. This life is not all there is, and I am very thankful for that. We are not just living in this singular moment. We are living with the assurance of eternity. 
all God's promises about His eternal kingdom, they will come true. One day, we're going to hear Gabriel blow his trumpet. All evil is going to be destroyed. Sin will be no more. And true, pure, selfless love will rule the day every day. But listen. Giving thanks is not all about ancient history. And it's not all about the future. What I mean by that is we really don't have to go all the way back to creation or Jesus' birth or Jesus' death or his resurrection. And we don't have to go all the way to his second coming to discover that God is good. Our own personal history is filled with time after time of God showing us his love and blessing us over and over again. But remember, it is generally true that all that is required to make men unmindful of what they owe God for any blessing is that they should receive that blessing often and regularly. One of the problems of uh, our modern teaching that takes place on the internet and even behind the pulpit One of those problems is that they're teaching that if we turn to God, everything will always be great. You won't get sick. If you will, if you do get sick, you're always going to be healed. If you turn to God, you're going to have money like you never dreamed of. Your relationships are all going to be fantastic. And the unfortunate thing is so many people have bought into that lie. And when trouble does come, God has disappointed them. Isn't that a sad state of affairs? And therefore, they cannot be thankful because of such heretical teaching. Folks, we have lived our life full of blessings, and they've been consistent, and they've been regular. (laughs) Don't allow the bad days... Don't allow the bad weeks to cause us to forget how gracious and merciful and forgiving and overflowing with blessings God has been to us. Always. Living a life of thanks is not a matter of being thankful for everything. Living a life of thanks is being thankful no matter what happens. Thankful because we know we serve the one true God who loves us and gave himself for us. Carpe diem, yes. Seize the day. Seize the day, remembering all that God has done for you and all the promises that he has waiting for you. A home where all the suffering and trials of this life will pale in comparison to the glory we shall share with our Savior. So on this Thanksgiving day, I say to all of us, keep the faith. Keep the faith. Life is hard. Even for Christians, life is hard. But God is good. And he is faithful. We must be thankful. Give thanks to the Lord for he is good. His love endures forever.